Good afternoon. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The next item of business is Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body Questions. And I would ask uh, those members who wish to request a supplementary question if they could press the request to speak buttons now or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letter R during the relevant question. And again, uh, succinct questions and answers would be much appreciated. Question number one, Jamie Green. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, in light of reported concerns, what consideration it is giving to additional funding for increased security personnel and security for MSP surgeries and local offices. Clear Baker. Um, thank you. At our meeting on the 4th of November, we considered options for further security support that would be available to members following the death of Sir David Amos. We recognise any changes to security provision would be expected to have budget implications. However, the corporate body is clear that the safety of members and their staff should not be compromised on grounds of cost. For members' information, we have commissioned the following urgent work. A review of advice regarding loan working in local offices, including extending the provision of loan work devices. Working with Police Scotland to introduce an annual security briefing targeted to issues in members' regions and a project to establish how to effectively provide security support to MSPs at surgery meetings, including an assessment of viability of providing security operatives, if that is appropriate. Um, as the member can appreciate, these are sensitive matters to discuss in a public forum and the corporate body has agreed that a fuller security update will be shared with members soon. Jamie Green. I do appreciate the sensitivity of the nature of the discussions and everyone in the chamber will send our thoughts and condolences to the friends and family of Sir David Amos. No one in public service or public office or indeed politics should go to work and not come home. But we also have a duty to protect our staff and also members of the public who attend our surgeries and our local offices. And we're keen to be as accessible as we can. But can I ask if there's the consideration being given to a centralised approach to the procurement of offering potential third-party security presence for those members who feel that they might need it. And for members who might just want to do it now, are they free to contract those services privately? And will their current office provision allow them to do so? Clear Baker. Uh, thank you. The member raises important points, and I do appreciate the comments around member security and the staff security. Uh, the Parliament does currently offer a centrally managed security upgrade for local offices, although members can choose to go ahead and contract the work themselves. And I would advise members to contact the security office to discuss this matter further if they wish to proceed with uh, security measures at this point in time. Uh, question number two, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body when it will make a decision regarding the level of MSP allowances for staff for 2022-23. Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. All my antenna have been trained to suppose this is a trick question because Miss Bailey knows the answer even better than I do, I think, to, to the question she's asked. The SPCB will be submitting its budget for 2022-23 for consideration at the Finance and Public Administration Committee on the 21st of December. This will include the proposed uprating of the staff cost provision for 2022-23. Jackie Bailey. Um, never a trick question, I can assure you of that, presiding officer, um, and I'm delighted to hear the timetable. Of course, when the Scottish Parliament last uprated the staff salary allowance, they did so based on ASH and AWE, the annual survey of hours and earnings and the average weekly earnings. At that time, it generated an increase of 2.96%. According to SPICE, the comparable figure from both those sources, um, it would this time be 4.4%. Is that the figure that will be applied effective from 1st of April 2022? Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank Ms Bailey for that. It would, probably would be inappropriate of me to preempt the presentation of the budget to the Finance Committee, but Ms Bailey would be absolutely correct to say that we have been using the particular measure that she has been suggesting to uprate the office cost provision and staff cost provision. Question number three, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body when it last met trade unions representing Scottish Parliamentary Service and MSP staff. Jackson Carlow. Uh, the corporate body has a, partner, a partnership arrangement with the Scottish Parliamentary Service's three recognised trade unions, PCS, Prospect and the FDA. And Parliament officials meet regularly with them on a range of employment matters. The last formal partnership board meeting took place in October this year. 
The SPCB has had no recent meetings with trade unions representing MSPs staff. Paul Sweeney. I thank uh, Mr Carlo for the answer. And as a member of the GMB trade union, I welcome the strong relationship with trade unions representing parliamentary staff. But this is uh, sorely lacking when it comes to those unions who represent the staff that members and party groups employ. So if we truly value the principles of fair work and giving workers a stake in decisions affecting them in this place, surely the SPCB, as the ultimate financial controller of the allowances we use to pay our staff, have to properly engage with trade unions like the GMB on a regular basis. Jackson Carlo. I do understand that various uh, party groupings have arrangements with trade unions, but the SPCB has no locus to do so in relation to MSP staff. The SPCB is responsible for funding of the reimbursement of members' expenses scheme, including the staff cost provision, and the determining which indices are used to uprate the overall provisions of the scheme. In 2020, the SPCB reviewed the indices used for the uprating of the scheme and in so doing, uh, rep and was made aware of tr representations from trade unions representing MSP staff. The SPCB agreed to use a basket of indices for more uprating the SP SCP on the basis that it would provide a more steady basis for future increases. We do so on the basis that individual MSPs remain responsible as employers of their staff for setting and managing their staff's pay and cost of living increases within the provisions of the expenses scheme. It's not within the locus of the SPCB as we are not the employer of MSP staff. MSPs themselves are. Question number four, Jackie Dunbar. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what support it provides to MSPs in connection with the employment of armed forces reservists and to armed forces reservists who work for the Scottish Parliament or MSPs. Jackson Carlow. Uh, can I thank Jackie Dunbar for the question? The, the corporate body is committed to supporting members of the reserve forces or those wishing to join the reserve forces. Staff who are armed forces reservists are entitled to take five days paid special leave each year to attend training. MSPs, as the employers of their staff, also have discretion to grant the same entitlement to their staff. Reservists who are mobilised for active service are protected in law from detriment, such as the termination of their employment, because they have been called up to active service. Jackie Dunbar. I thank Mr Carlow for his answer. Mobilisation of reservists can sometimes happen at short notice and leave employers with unplanned training and recruitment costs. The MOD acknowledges this and reflects it in the form of compensation provided to non-public sector employers. Would the SPCB consider making additional budget available to MSPs who have staff mobilised to cover expenses arising from mobilisation? Jackson Carlow. Um, that's an interesting suggestion and it's one that I shall take back and discuss with my colleagues on the corporate body. And question number five, James Dornan, who hopefully is joining us remotely. If I maybe cue him in again, that might work. Calling James Dornan. Will I go on to questions? Okay, we'll, we'll slightly change the order uh, to see if we can sort out whatever technical difficulty has arisen and I call question number six, Emma Roddick. The Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, what review has been undertaken of heating the Parliament building in light of updated ventilation requirements? Clear Baker. Uh, ventilation of workplaces is an increasingly important mitigation in limiting the spread of COVID-19 and other viruses. A review of the ventilation system at Holyrood took place earlier this year, which confirmed that the mechanical ventilation systems at Holyrood are working well. There is a building management system at Holyrood which monitors temperatures across the campus. It controls the temperature during the preset hours of occupancy and automatically activates the heating system if temperatures fall below a certain point. There are parts of the building, however, that rely on natural ventilation, and this does mean opening windows, vents and doors to provide sufficient fresh air. Emma Roddick. Um, given the importance of staying safe and healthy this year more than ever, could the corporate body advise what the ambient temperature should be in the Parliament building, specifically in offices, and outline what support can be given to members, staff and SPCB staff to ensure that they have a comfortable and safe working environment? Clear Baker. 
Um, I do appreciate this can be a challenging uh, building to to heat, and it varies between different points of the building. Um, I would urge the member to contact facilities management and report any issues if there is a particular concern about um, her own circumstances or staff circumstances, and they will work quickly to resolve any issues. We, do, we are facing winter, and we are trying to find a balance between sufficient ventilation and making sure that members and their staff are comfortable in their workspaces. Uh, question number seven, Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body to outline its position on collective decision making following media reports of division regarding the security of MSPs and the Scottish Parliament building. Clare Baker. Um, as the member will know, members of the corporate body are elected by the Parliament, and when acting as members of the corporate body, they do so in a non party political manner. All members of SPCB are entitled to their views on a range of significant policy, operational and resourcing decisions considered by the corporate body. But at the end of the day, any decision is taken in the name of the corporate body, and that is what is important. Stephen Kerr. I thank Claire Baker for her answer. Uh, we all found out about this, the Parliament's desig designated status through Maggie Chapman's briefing of the press. Now, I've been on a number of boards of directors through uh, all my years. I can't fathom a situation where a board member would publicly criticise one of our decisions as a board and then retain their place on the board. You simply can't work in a situation where one person is intent on sabotaging the collective decisions of the board. So does the corporate body agree with me that any of its members who publicly undermine its decisions should resign from the board? Clear Baker. Uh, the member raises this issue in his characteristic fashion and his views are noted. I would say that the minutes from each meeting are published and our work is transparent and is open to scrutiny. And the corporate body does operate on a collegiate basis. Of course, as a member would expect, there can be differing views and that is to be encouraged and they are important in shaping our decisions. Our discussions often reflect the wide range of views that may be shared by members in the chamber as well as wider society. The important thing is that all decisions are fully discussed and determined in the name of the corporate body and are not part of political. And I am satisfied that the corporate body is effectively working together in a cooperative way. Question number eight, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliament, Parliamentary Corporate Body what action it has taken to assess the effectiveness and utility of the new Scottish Parliament website. Maggie Chapman. Can I thank Claire Adamson for that question? We use web analytics, user research and feedback to assess the effectiveness of the website on an ongoing basis. We have a continuous improvement programme for taking forward work on the Parliament website and we use this insight to inform how we prioritise various bits of work. We are proactive in seeking feedback and to give you an example of that, we are about to launch an online user survey to gather further information. Claire Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I uh, am not speaking alone uh, as I have had conversations with colleagues, with students, with stakeholders and constituents who are having trouble finding information they need on the new website. The committee sections, for example, are difficult to navigate, uh, list meetings without any context, or um, uh, unlike the previous uh, website. And uh, something frustrating to me is a convener who inherited from two different Session 5 committees, the drop-downs on the old website have now been changed, making it very, very difficult to search the OR. So uh, I am concerned that this could be um, reputationally damaging for the Parliament, and I am asking the, the corporate body to consider an independent review that includes a website comparison with other legislators' offerings. Oh. <laughs> Apologies, presiding That's officer. That is OK. Has you finished it? OK. Uh, Maggie Chapman. <laughs> Thank you for, 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 that, for that supplementary, uh, Ms Adams, Adamson. And I think the, for some of the frustrations that, that you've outlined are shared uh, by, by members of the corporate body as well. Uh, I, th I think in response to that, my, my, my answer would be that no website is ever finished. And, and we, are, we do have ongoing um, a programme of, of changes and enhancements to make to the website, informed by feedback, your feedback and, and the feedback of others. 
The previous website was over 10 years old and built on outdated technology that is, was no longer supported, so we had to make substantial changes to the technical side of, of the website to make improvements. And we know that there, there are things that we need, we need to uh, adapt. So, for, for example, the search function is part of ongoing work. We've already made some changes, to, uh, in, for example, in filtering options and, and that kind of thing in response to feedback, and other improvements will be made by the end of this financial year. Committee reports, vice briefings, those kinds of things are currently on a different site, which does make things difficult, and we are in, in the process of uh, creating the uniform site, and that should be done um, in, in the next few months. Thank you. Question number nine, uh, Paul McLennan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what the Scottish Parliament's budget is for both inbound and outbound school visits. Maggie Chapman. Can I thank Paul McClellan for, this answer, for his question? Pre-COVID, our education services offered three different support packages to schools. A visit to the Scottish Parliament, a visit to the school, and resources for independent use in the classroom by the teacher. The average annual spend across the years 2018 to 2020 was £194,260. The cost of providing inward and outward visits is roughly equal, £97,802 for inward and £96,458 for outward, and that includes travel costs. We are budgeting in the 22-23 year for a similar amount as we anticipate a gradual return to pre-COVID demand and service levels towards the end of this academic year. In 2020-21 and 21-22, we have not been travelling and have ensured that this budget has been available to support other areas of the Parliament where required. Paul McLennan. Can I thank Maggie Chapman for that answer? Can I ask which schools, if any, are regulars and how schools which don't engage or those in harder to reach areas can be encouraged? Maggie Chapman. Can, can I thank, thank uh, uh, Paul McClellan very much for that supplementary? I, th I think that there are a couple, a couple of things for us to consider here. What we want to make sure is that the offer that we make to schools is available for all schools, regardless of their proximity to Parliament and regardless of, of their regularity of engagement, I would say. And we have seen over the last few months that the, the work that the team is doing to, to reach out to schools we are reaching new schools and we are trying to enhance that engagement to make sure that we, do, we don't see schools that in, have repeated engagement while other areas are left neglected or, or out of touch. Thank you. Question number 10, Stuart McMillan. Thanks for joining also to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what assistance it will provide to MSPs to make improvements to the ventilation of the local offices in order to support the reopening when that decision is taken. Clear Baker. Um, I thank the member for his question. As recognised in a previous answer, uh, ventilation of workplaces is an increasingly important mitigation in limiting the spread of COVID-19. In recognising the different types of premises members have for their local offices, a range of support will be put in place. First, some general advice has been prepared and will point members and their staff towards helpful information available from the Scottish Government and Health and Safety Executive. As part of that guidance, there are tools available that can be used to identify where ventilation improvements may be needed. Secondly, a drop-in ventilation clinic will be run online later this month and officials will be in touch with details. And thirdly, specialist expertise will be made available over the telephone or in person for offices that have particularly complex or unclear requirements. Stuart McMillan. Uh, I thank uh, Claire Baker for that reply. And certainly at some point, we will be allowed to fully reopen our constituency offices and can ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body to prioritise those members whose offices will actually be shop fronts or on the high streets uh, where there will be other particular challenges that will actually affect the offices. And uh, certainly, uh, I'm quite sure that colleagues across the chamber will also want to ensure that the staff who do work in these offices will actually have a healthy, clean working environment. Clear Baker. Um, um, the member will appreciate that the priority so far has been ensuring Holyrood can operate as safely as possible, and that's rightly been the focus. But however, local offices will need to be given support in order to carry out risk assessments and how to operate these premises safely as well. The focus will now shift towards local offices and addressing their ventilation considerations. And I do recognise the importance of meeting the needs of all offices. Members have various arrangements and various challenges in achieving a safe working place for their uh, members of staff and for constituents. And this is something that the corporate body will look at closely as we develop the plans for reopening of offices. Question number 11, John Mason. Uh, thank you. 
to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether members' annual reports can be delivered after 4 February 2022, and if not, what the reasons are for its position on the matter. Tyson Carlow. Uh, thank Mr Mason for the question. Um, as per the allowances notice that was issued to all members on the 10th of November, members' annual reports cannot be issued between the period of 5th of February 22 and the election to local authorities on the 5th of May. Inclusive, in line with the SPC's long-standing policy on members' publications. And the corporate body has taken this long-standing position to ensure the neutrality of any election without any undue or perceived influence, intentional or unintentional, coming through the issuing of members' parliamentary funded publications. Advance notice of this has been provided to enable members to plan the issuing of their publications over the next three months prior to the deadline. Annual reports and other parliamentary funded publications can be issued as normal following that election. John Mason. Hey, well, thank Mr uh, Jackson Carlaw for that reply. H however, if the main reason is that it's a long standing uh, decision, I don't accept that every long standing decision is necessarily the correct one. And it just seems to me that three months is an excessively long period to stop members, and especially perhaps new members, from issuing an important annual report. I mean, for example, Parliament stopped six weeks before the election last year, and six weeks would seem to me a more reasonable time than three months. Thank you, Jackson Carlos. I thank Mr Mason for that observation. We did, the corporate body actually did last consider this matter in the previous session in 2019 uh, in relation to the unexpected UK general election. And at that point, the corporate body agreed that it remained vital to maintain the prohibited period and the neutrality that comes with not issuing such publications. Uh, and any time we have discussed it as a corporate body, while I have some sympathy uh, with the argument that Mr Mason makes, there is the potential, I think it does exist, uh, when this parliament is sitting, given that the UK parliament does not fund such publications themselves, there is the opportunity, however intentional or unintentional, for a publication submitted by members of this parliament to potentially, for example, include people who might be standing in the local authority election thereafter, and that that would be an unreasonable use of parliamentary resources and potentially breach the political neutrality intended by the annual reports, which are there for members to communicate with their constituents. The reason we give as much notice as we do is to allow people to make proper provision so that they can fit within that schedule. Question number 12, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what consideration has been given to providing parliamentary services out with the usual hours. Maggie Chapman. Thank, uh, can I thank Willie Coffey for that question? The SPCB recognises the importance of providing flexible, responsive parliamentary services which support MSPs and their staff in fulfilling their roles. The pandemic has shown us new ways of working and there are lessons such as the value of extending IT support until the end of members' business that we can take forward both in terms of our response to the pandemic and more broadly in relation to the provision of services. Providing comprehensive parliamentary services has to be balanced with staff rotors and shifts, a commitment to fair work employment practices and the budgetary constraints, constraints that the Parliament works within. SPCB is currently discussing how services may be able to adapt and improve post-pandemic. We will seek to take members' views as part of this so that we can ensure we are providing excellent parliamentary services to support members and the way in which they choose to work. Willie Coffey. Can I thank my colleague for that answer? I'm content with that response, presiding officer, and happy to allow us to move on to next business. We have a supplementary from Jimmy Green. Thank you. Uh, can I ask the corporate body uh, when it is likely that cross-party groups will be able to meet in person? These are a vital function of the parliament and the ability for members of the public to engage with members and its parliament. And I'm sure all of us would like to see them uh, running as soon as possible, given that other members of the public are already coming into the parliament for other functions. Maggie Chapman. Can, can I thank Jamie Green for that supplementary question? And yes, you're right. Uh, uh, CPGs and others are, are eager to get back to meeting in person. We are we take take we review this on a regular basis, on an ongoing basis, and we are balancing uh, risks and mitigations to the risks of, of, of virus transmission within the building. And we, we hope that we will have an update prior to Christmas, prior to the Christmas recess, in advance of returning next January. Uh, thank you. It's not been possible to, to uh, hook up with James Dornan. That concludes uh, Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body questions. We will now move on to the next item of business, which is portfolio questions. And this is on rural... Oh, 
fares and islands will allow short pause to allow frontbenchers to change their seats. <laughs>